Hello and welcome to The Pastor Study. I'm the pastor, Dave Thomas. We're here in my study, and this is the study for Sunday, May 9th, the second of our four-part series, The Holy Spirit Is, concluding on May 23rd, Pentecost Sunday. Each week we'll be considering aspects of the ministry of the Holy Spirit and who the Spirit is to us. Last week we looked at the Holy Spirit is our comforter, and this week the Holy Spirit is our advocate. During the series, we're focusing on only one text per week, and this week's passage is from the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verses 5 to 11. Now, this is a continuation of the message that Jesus delivered to his disciples, which we heard part of in last week's reading, as he prepared them for what's coming, his betrayal, arrest, and execution by crucifixion. It is often referred to as the farewell discourse. Jesus tells them about all of this, but he also tells them on this and other occasions that after his death, he will rise again on the third day. But the disciples don't seem to absorb that information. Instead, they are consumed by their confusion and fears and concerns. What will happen to them? What will happen to their movement if their master is taken from them? Jesus, in both last week's and this week's passages, is addressing those fears and concerns. And one of his responses is to assure his followers that while he is leaving them physically, they will be not left alone. They will not be abandoned. They will not be left comfortless. He and his heavenly father will send them another, the Holy Spirit, whom Jesus calls the advocate in this passage. So let's right, dive right into this part of the 16th chapter of John. We begin at verse five. As Jesus says to his disciples, now I am going to him who sent me. Jesus is clear here about several things. He's clear that he was sent by God the Father, God who so loved the world that he gave his only son to save the world and not condemn it. He's also clear that his dying in this life opens up for him a return to the one who sent him. He tells his disciples this, and then he adds, yet none of you asks me, where are you going? Interesting to think about. What does Jesus mean here? Does he primarily mean, you guys haven't even asked about me. Don't you even care what's going to happen to me, where I'll be going? Or is he more noting that his impending departure by his death appears to his disciples to be not good news, but, but bad news, disastrous news, news of his defeat? And does it so fill his disciples with sorrow that they don't even want to talk about it? Well, maybe a bit of both. One commentator I read this week wrote this about that question. The question, where are you going? Where are you going? Asked by the disciples, but in other occasions too, is sometimes not so much about where you are going, but why are you leaving? It's not about destination. The disciples are worried about the fact that Jesus plans to leave, not where he's headed. Jesus himself seems to know this, sense this, as he says next is recorded in verse six. But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. And we might think, well, yeah, that's natural, right? Our hearts would be filled with sorrow too. It's an appropriate response to this bad news. But I think Jesus is prodding them a bit. Something like, are you guys so focused on yourself and your sorrow that you're not even concerned about me? Much less capable of seeing the big picture here. God is at work, God's plan for salvation. Makes me wonder how many times that's been true for me. That my response to something is, that's not what I want. Rather than, what is it that God wants here? Or how does God want me to respond to this news or situation or opportunity God has brought to me. Jesus in verse seven tries to move the disciples beyond themselves in their consuming sorrow. So let's read on. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. The Greek word here means advantage or benefit or, or quite literally, it is to your profit. Jesus says it's to your advantage or profit that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. As we pointed out last week, the Greek word here behind the English translation advocate 
is a rather technical term. It's the word paraclete. Basically, in the Greco-Roman world, paraclete describes someone who came alongside another. It was used in judicial settings and in academic ones as well, and elsewhere. <clears throat> in the courtroom, a paraclete was sort of a combination of a defense attorney, a character witness, and a comforting companion or, or advocate. The term was also used of one charged with both tutoring and chaperoning students, boys in that time and place, on their way to school, between classes, or if they went away from home to school, we might call boarding school. These students would have their primary teachers, rabbis, professors, if you will, but their paraclete would be like a, an after-school homework helper, a, a tutor. Plus, the paraclete would fill the role of monitor and chaperone, making sure the boys kept on the straight and narrow. To call the Holy Spirit a paraclete, as Jesus does here, would be for his first hearers to bring these real-world images to mind. It would help them to understand who the Holy Spirit was. God the Spirit is like one who's with you in a challenging, confusing situation, like in a courtroom, <clears throat> especially if you're the one accused of a crime or being sued. The Spirit will stand up for you and with you. God the Spirit is like a tutor, helping you to learn and apply the lessons of the teacher, that is, Jesus. And also like a chaperone, who helps you be your best and do your best, keeping you focused on the better things, and away from that which might distract or derail you. Thinking of it this way, we can start to see how it is to the disciples' advantage to be sent the Spirit, the paraclete, the advocate. And I'll talk some more about that in Sunday's message. Another advantage is, unlike the earthly Jesus before his resurrection, the Spirit is not limited to being in one place at one time. God the Spirit has promised to come alongside not just some people, like the 12 apostles, or for some period of time, like the 33 years of Jesus' earthly life, or for just some special circumstances, but to all believers for all times in all circumstances. The Spirit is our advocate who is with us always to help direct and encourage and guide and tutor us to help us to know right from wrong, to help us fulfill our calling to be witnesses of God's grace and advocates for the values of God's kingdom. Another commentator I came across in my research added something helpful to me anyway about this advantage. They wrote this, the Holy Spirit, the advocate, provides the ability for each Christian to have constant, personal, immediate, indwelling contact with God. Instead of having to rely on someone else to mediate for them, like the priests of the Old Testament, or even like the high priest, Christ himself, during his earthly time with the disciples. Believers in Christ, gifted by the Spirit, can focus on the voice of God inside them, in their hearts where the Spirit dwells. That doesn't make Christians infallible or all-knowing, but it does mean we have the advantage of God the Spirit's influence in any and all times and circumstances, as far as we are willing to listen and submit to the Spirit's leading. Well, let's continue now, starting with verse 8, and we'll go all the way through verse 11. It's just one sentence in Greek. In these verses, Jesus speaks of the paraclete, the advocate, in a courtroom setting style still, but it makes me think not of a lawyer for the defense, but more of a prosecuting attorney. Here's what he said. <clears throat> and when he comes, that is the paraclete, the advocate, the spirit, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because they do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father and you will see me no longer. About judgment, because the, rule, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. In verse 8, Jesus says the Spirit will prove the world wrong. <clears throat> Other English versions more directly translate the Greek here as convict the world. The Greek term is el ing kai, which means to convict or rebuke or convince or even accuse. So far as the unbelieving world is concerned, the Holy Spirit will bring accusation and expose their sin. The Spirit will prove the ways of the world to be wrong, that is, counter to the ways of God, as seen in the teaching, preaching, and lived out example of Christ himself. <clears throat> I'll also say more about this in, on Sunday's, in Sunday's message, but for now, 
I'll point out that one of the main roles of the Holy Spirit as our advocate is to clarify what is good and godly and what is not. Now, those with open hearts will receive this as what we might call constructive criticism, while for others it will feel like conviction, proof that they have chosen to follow what follow ways other than God's ways. I coached a lot of baseball with David and his teams as he was growing up, from t-ball all the way through coaching his high school team. In learning the many skills, as well as the attitudes, efforts, and energy it takes to become a better player, some boys I coached were open to correction for the sake of improvement. They wanted to be coached. They wanted someone with more knowledge and experience to tell them what they were doing wrong and how they could learn to do things right or better to reach whatever potential they might have. A few players, however, didn't so much like this coaching or the correcting process. Some because they were stubborn. They wanted to swing the bat or try to field the ball the way they wanted to, even if the results were proof that their way wasn't working out very well. And some took instruction as sort of a personal affront. It hurt their feelings. And a few others had other coaches, coaches, mostly their dads, who were teaching them other ways, not always very good ways. The boys who got better, like David, <clears throat> were the ones open to good coaching, and not just mine, but any good instruction that helped them improve. Changing your swing or your pitching motion or how you grip the ball isn't always easy, and sometimes the results aren't instant. And changing your approach or attitude Learning to bring an all-star attitude or a big lead effort to every practice and game, that takes commitment. It takes want to. You have to want to work at it. But you also have to want to be doing the right kind of work, the right kind of drills, to hone the right kind of skills. You have to be open to coaching. I'd often say, practice doesn't make perfect. Practice just makes habits. Perfect practice builds perfect habits. The Holy Spirit is our advocate, sent to us to instruct us, to coach us, to correct us, maybe even sometimes to convict us. It is to our great and eternal advantage to be open to the Spirit's coaching. Well, I hope you're blessed by this series on the Holy Spirit, and I hope you've found our time here in the pastor study this week to be interesting and educational and uplifting and maybe even a little entertaining too. I'm learning a lot in my research about the Holy Spirit and I'm glad to share with you some of those things that don't make it into the message on Sunday here in the pastor study. We'll continue the next two weeks considering who the Spirit is in worship and here in our study time together too. I'm looking forward to it. Until then, as always, let us be doers of God's word and not hearers only. And I hope to see you soon right here in the pastor study. So long.